Hello, Keith Kaiser here again with Studies in the Book of Acts. We're working our way through the scriptures systematically. We're at Acts chapter 12 today. And last time we saw the martyrdom of James at the hands of this wicked Herod the king. There was a heritage of murder and of opposition to the truth from this family. And sadly, it was ongoing here in Hebrews chapter 12. So we start our reading today at Acts 12 and verse 3. And because he, that is Herod, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now the motivation for this act of persecution, for this murder of killing James, uh, was politically motivated, we might say. He saw that it pleased the Jews. So he was happy to curry favor with them by opposing their enemy, by opposing these people of the way. Even in point of fact, when James was not really an enemy of the Jewish people, he was among those who were bearing witness to Israel of Israel's Messiah, that he was going to preach to them the hope of the resurrection, the same way that Paul would later speak about in this book of Acts. And James was a witness to the risen Christ in preaching the good news that Jews and Gentiles could be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. As Romans 1.16 reminds us, Paul says, Therefore I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, or we could translate it to the Gentile. So this is a wonderful message of good news that James and John were preaching, and James sealed his testimony to it, averred the truth of it by laying down his life. And he's part of that unlisted legion, as Jock Purvis described them, that those martyrs that are maybe forgotten by men today or not often spoke about, but Hebrews 11 would say of them, of whom the world was not worthy. And such was James. He was killed by the sword. And Herod thought, well, since this is politically expedient, this is getting me ahead with the Jews that I have to rule over. And then he proceeded further, it says, to seize Peter also. And as we noted last time, these were the days of the unleavened bread, uh, the very same time in the festal calendar of Passover, first fruits and unleavened bread, unleavened bread and first fruits, if I put them in the right order. And that time of year in the springtime on our calendar was the same time of year when the Lord Jesus was crucified. So maybe uh, the Christians could look at this, the believers would look at this and say, oh no, here we go again. This is history repeating. Once again, our enemies are killing us. It's open season on Christians. So when he had arrested him, verse 4, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So he's put in prison, uh, we would call this maximum security. He's got four squads of soldiers there as if he's some super dangerous criminal. This is a tremendously violent serial killer or a very cunning and nasty terrorist. And yet Peter's nothing of the kind. Peter is not harming anybody and he's not violent towards anyone. He's a witness of the risen Christ and a minister of the gospel. And so verse five, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Isn't that wonderful? A believer may be physically separated from other believers. We may not be able to go out to the local church. We may be on a bed of sickness and not able to get out to the meetings, and yet the church can still pray for us. They can still have their influence on us, spiritually speaking, where we are. And what resources we have, the theology behind this verse, that we have a throne of grace, that we have the Lord on that throne who is listening to us. That as First, uh, first John 5 reminds us, that if we ask anything in his name, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. In other words, he hears our prayer and will unfailingly answer it. Maybe not answer it according to just the way we've asked, but he will answer it to whatever is according to his will, which I assure you is best because he knows 
what the best is in any given situation. And how lovely to read that constant prayer was offered. You know, these people weren't forgetting about Peter. It wasn't out of sight, out of mind. They were diligently and regularly praying for him. And no doubt the urgency was borne out by the fact that James had so recently been killed. And they thought, ah, what if another one of the 12 is killed? What if Peter is killed? You know, James was killed by the sword here, and Herod thought he was exerting great political power. But we remember Peter himself asked the Lord Jesus in Matthew 19, Behold, we've left everything to follow you. What will we have? And the Lord said that in the regeneration, when the world was made over for the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, that the twelve would sit with him and judge Israel on twelve thrones. So, he would be part of the administration governing the world under the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus, who after his second coming to earth is going to sit on the throne of David and rule over Israel. And James was not going to be deprived of that. Uh, Herod may kill him, but his destiny is still to sit on a throne with the Lord Jesus. His destiny, therefore, is to overcome and sit with him on his throne even as the Lord Jesus overcame and has sat down with his father on his throne, as we read in Revelation in the early part in the seven churches letters. But that's another sermon. Anyway, back to Peter. Here's Peter in prison. And we might say, well, what can the believers do for him? Are they going to mount an assault on the prison? Are they going to sneak in, climb over the wall and take on those four squads of soldiers? No, they're going to do something much more powerful. They're going to pray for Peter. They offered prayer to God. Prayer to God was offered for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 6. Now, often a person who is condemned to die in prison doesn't sleep very much in their final days before that sentence is carried out. And I've heard about people in death row the night before that they are executed. They don't sleep at all in many cases. There's too much anxiety. And yet look at the perfect practical peace that Peter is enjoying here, that he has what Philippians 4 describes as the peace that passes understanding because he knows that he's in God's hands. Now, he doesn't know what God's going to do. But he trusts God, so he's able to sleep. And you know, that's the attitude we need to have. Whatever comes, I'm in God's hands. I'm going to trust him. Because I've trusted my eternal well-being to the Lord Jesus, I've repented of my sins and called on him to save me, I can trust him with my temporal life as well. So if he wants me to live X number of years and then take me home through death, if he wants to allow persecutors to kill me the way they killed James, so be it. The will of the Lord be done. But if he wants me to live on, nothing the enemies can do can rob him of that desire and purpose for me. He will carry it forward. And Peter had that confidence, that faith in God. And so the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So again, maximum security. We're talking about Alcatraz or the Supermax in Colorado or, uh, you know, pick your your toughest prisons here. All the guards are there. All the security measures are in place. And yet God's going to intervene. Verse seven. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his, ain and his chains fell off his hands. Now it doesn't say the angel of the Lord. It says an angel of the Lord. So I take it this was a regular type of angel that God had sent. It's the Lord's angel whom he sends, not the angel of the Lord, which was so often in the Old Testament, a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. But nonetheless, this angel is acting in the authority and in the power of God. And he comes, and in that dark prison, a light shone. Now, many of our brothers and sisters know about this right now in the world. There are believers in different parts of the world that are in prison for the faith. And yet the light shines in that dark prison because they can put them in squalid cells. They can put them in a virtual dungeon. They can put them in solitary confinement. And yet what they can't do 
is rob them of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm not saying they're not suffering hunger and great privation. And we read from time to time on things like Voices of the Martyrs about some that are hungry and some that are greatly ill. And yet, even in the most difficult times physically, the Lord's light can shine upon a believer. And that's the wonderful thing that we walk in the light with him, 1 John 1 tells us. So even in a prison, the Lord is there. And it's a wonderful thing. And many times we read, not only in the Bible, such as in Acts 16, when Paul and Silas are there in the prison in Philippi, but we read throughout church history about different believers, men and women, who've been imprisoned for the faith, and yet they rejoice in God, they worship, they sing to the Lord in some cases, in many cases, they win others to the Lord. Now the angel comes and he raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. I wonder if this is where Wesley got the image in his great hymn, And Can It Be? One of my favorite verses of any hymn in the English language. Um, he says that long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Now Wesley was describing his experience of coming out of darkness into light, of passing from death unto life, of going from one dead in trespass and sins to one quickened, made alive in Christ Jesus, regenerated by his grace, born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And coming into that knowledge of salvation, that personal knowledge of the Lord, he would write that beautiful fourth stanza of his hymn. And yet the imagery is very like what's described of Peter here, about this angel coming and shining the light and telling him to get up and his chains falling off his hands. You know, this was better than Houdini or David Blaine or somebody like that. I mean, Peter didn't have to do any sort of escape artistry. The power of God through this angel, this messenger, did that. Verse 8. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he, put, and he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Now notice these hallmarks of historicity. That it's not just like, oh, this is the fairy godmother showing up and and putting the magic wand over Peter like Cinderella had, and suddenly the rags are transformed into a beautiful dress, and the mice become coach horses, and the pumpkin becomes a great uh, coach to take Cinderella to the ball. <laughs> no, this is very realistic. Peter is sleeping. He's awakened. He has to be unchained. Then what's he have to do? He has to put his clothes on. This is natural to someone who has been sleeping and now is awakened. And so he went out and followed him, verse 9, and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Now notice that. It wasn't immediately apparent to Peter that this is how God was going to work, that God was going to interpose his power miraculously. He wasn't always assuming a supernatural action on the part of God. Not that he didn't know that God could act supernaturally. I mean, after all, this is the apostle of Christ who walked on the water to the Lord Jesus, at least till he got his eyes off the Lord Jesus. But he assumed it was a vision. Then verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Well, there's a great missionary biography, autobiography actually, written by the late Jeffrey Bull, a British missionary in China and later Tibet, who was captured by the communist Chinese when they invaded Tibet. And they put him in uh, basically a concentration camp for about three years. And the book about that experience he titled, When Iron Gates Yield. And here we see an example of iron gates yielding. The gate just opens of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. God sent the angel to do what Peter couldn't do. He couldn't break out of prison. He couldn't get by the guards. He couldn't be released from the chains or open the gate of his own accord. God did that for him. But now Peter's able to do the rest. Verse 11, when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation 
of the Jewish people. So he delivered him from the hand of Herod. What power did Herod have in the face of this God of power? And from the expectation of the Jewish people who may have thought, well, Peter's going to go the same way that his master, Jesus of Nazareth, went. Just like we took care of Jesus at the Feast of Unleavened Bread at that time of Passover, then uh, we're going to do the same thing here to Peter. And yet God delivered him out of the hands of the enemies. And God's able to deliver us from every enemy. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus points to ultimate victory. Victory even over death and the grave and Satan and hell itself. And so we can thank God for the victor, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us more than conquerors through him that loved us, as Romans 8 says. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time to see what happens to Peter after the great escape.